Welcome back to the Crossboard Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 6, Lana Bentley. Lana, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here, Chris. Lana, my first question to all my guests is, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Yeah, that, that's a neat question and certainly one um, that invites contemplation. So I found myself, I found myself actually traveling way, way back in time uh, when I thought about that. And I think it comes from having had the experience, uh, Chris, of, of knowing what it feels like to succeed and knowing what it feels like to not succeed, even in the face of working really, really hard and giving it my best shot. And so I can say with great confidence, um, I know I wouldn't be where I am today in my life were it not for the community of support that I had around me. And I think those were coaches, teachers, bosses, family members who would just encourage me to go a little bit further. And I think there was probably people who helped me, Chris, in ways that I'm not even aware of. But having been the beneficiary of people who have, uh, who took the time uh, to invest in me, um, it just makes sense to me. Um, I'm not trying to balance out any kind of karmic scale, but, but I, I know what it feels like to have uh, a community of support around me. And I'm at a stage in my life. This is, this is why I said it <laughs> in the contemplation piece. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jennifer Lewis. She's an actress and a, yeah, so the mother of Black Hollywood. Um, I listened to an interview of hers about two years ago where she says everybody walks through their life. And at that moment when you realize you have fewer years ahead of you than you do behind you. You need to start making some decisions about what the heck am I gonna do with this time? And so a long-winded way of saying um, with the time that I'm ready, willing, able, healthy, and have the energy, uh, I wanna be a part of creating that community of support for, for others uh, who are similar to me and quite frankly, to some folks I haven't even met yet, but who might benefit from having that community of support. And so, um, I, I certainly want to acknowledge that there's been periods in my life where I wasn't super focused on community development and engagement. I spent a lot of time hanging around the mall food court and HMV and A&B Sound with my friends having fun <laughs> in my younger years. Like, you know, like, like, I've, I've had a lot of fun, Chris, but, uh, but once I got to like university and started volunteering with like, students for literacy, um, and I think once I actually got to see others who had less than me. And there was no explanation that made sense to me about why do I have this and other people have that? Like really it's just luck into the family that you're born into and the situation that you're born into. Um, and I've always been uh, curious <laughs> and, and I like to push um, to, to see what else is possible. And so I think it was probably my late teens, early twenties, definitely university, Chris when my eyes were just open to the world outside of woodbine woodlands. Um, and all of a sudden I started meeting people from all different walks of life and was just immediately captivated with um, their experiences and, and wanting, wanting to see people succeed uh, because I, I'd had that experience. I, I hope that answers the question, Chris. It wasn't it, terribly articulate or succinct, was it? <laughs> it was, it, it actually, you were the first guest on the show that I've ever heard someone say HMV was a hangout spot. So that is a, that to me in my university days, that's where I was. So thank you thank for- you. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you, you talk about duty, you talk about yeah. community, you can give back in many different ways, whether it be nonprofits, whether it be uh, through business, but you've chosen in this uh, year, this election to run per, uh, municipally for Ward 6. Why is that the best avenue for you to give back to help grow that community that you've talked about in your opening statement? Yeah, well, my background, Chris, is I am a registered social worker. And so to your point, I've had the opportunity to work in community-based settings as well as public health care 
And so most of my adult working uh, life has been spent um, in service of working for equitable uh, societies where people can live with dignity um, and certainly pursuit of peace and wellness. Um, that's always been where I've worked. Now, the tipping point, I suppose, of uh, what, what, takes, what takes a family therapist from an eating disorder program, now director of program strategy in a women's serving not-for-profit, what, what the heck makes her decide that she wants to run for office? I think a couple of things. Um, number one, I wanna see if I can really take what I've learned in those other realms where I was able to create positive impact, Chris, but on a much smaller scale. I wanna see if it's possible to take that same energy and take those learnings and take those perspectives and create impact on a bigger scale. And I would also say, Chris, that some of the issues that I'm most interested in I'm most interested in, you know, mental health, domestic violence. Those are issues where prevention and having really strong communities actually has a massive impact in preventing those issues from ever manifesting in the first place. And so I think local government is a really neat place to land to try and have that influence. Now, there's also a part of me, Chris, wherein, um, and I think you're very dialed in to our political context, so you already know this. There's not a lot of women on city council, Chris. And what? <laughs> I don't know if when you advertise this episode, it's going to be like breaking in capital letters. <laughs> not a lot of women in local politics. But um, fundamentally, I, I do believe in the adage, she can't be what she can't see. And so in my mind, as a woman who leads a very privileged life in many respects, um, if we want to see this happen, then we need to do it. And so, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have uh, the family support, support from friends, support from coworkers to pursue this. But I, I do think, Chris, some of the challenges that we're currently facing they're not gonna get any better. They're not gonna get any easier. And I don't think we're gonna see innovation around how do we solve these problems unless we see different voices at the table. And, and I wanna be clear, um, I, I think that talent comes in all shapes and sizes <laughs> and expressions of gender. So I think part of what I also wanna challenge just cause I don't know if you're gonna ask me this, but I'm just guessing is, um, you know, as it relates to being a woman running um, for office, I, I think that we need to rebuff the meme that when women run for office, um, it's to gain sympathy or purely, um, purely just to have a nice warm and fuzzy moment. We run because it's necessary and we also run because we have skills, ideas and qualifications that would be of benefit to the larger community. So, um, you know, I, I think there is a piece for me that's always been quite um, delicate to manage <laughs> is I have some demographics that aren't currently represented um, in council at all or in great measure. Uh, but I also think beyond those personal characteristics, I think that having a background working in healthcare where the ethos really is one of true equity and acceptance, right, Chris? No matter who you are, what you've done or where you're going, we give you healthcare. And I think we need that um, on, on city council now more than ever, because I think the temperature has certainly been cranked up uh, quite a bit in recent uh, years. So those are all the reasons why I've thrown my hat in the ring. But the other day I was having coffee with another candidate and she said, Lana, do people ever ask you why you're running? Like, why are you doing this? And I said, yeah. And she said, how do you answer? And I said, how do you answer? Because it really is like, so, some days it's just like, that's a really good question. <laughs> like there's, there's different ways to, um, to make a difference in your community. And this is certainly um, one of the most ambitious uh, undertakings I think a private citizen can endeavor in is to put themselves forward like this. But um, I like adventure, I like a challenge. And, and I, genuinely, I genuinely believe in the message of building strong, equitable, inclusive communities. So here I am.
do you have a political background where your family was your family political or are you sort of the odd woman out in your family where you are the first to run for any type of level of government? You know, th that is such a good question. So when my friends used to come over, um, there were books like, you know, Black Like Me, Roots. Um, these were the books that were on my parents' bookshelves. Uh, and some had far more provocative titles. And so, you know, my parents went to university in a time in our country and in our world uh, where oddly enough, issues of racial equity and social justice were very much alive. And so um, I, I think it's interesting um, how, uh, I think we've made great progress, but I think every so often there's a renewed call to action. I think we're in that moment right now. So. Um, you know, my parents definitely raised me with a really keen sense of awareness, Chris, that um, just because you have what you have, A, don't take it for granted, and B, please understand how hard other people had to work for you to have this. My parents did not have the same access to things that I do. Like, like no doubt, I'm here because of a lot of uh, sacrifice and hard work from racialized people. Uh, whom I've met and some I haven't. And in a weird way, I think me running for office is almost like the ultimate thank you note uh, to all those people uh, who've made it possible for me to be here. So um, I think my parents were very, very strongly aware of social issues and context. Um, now, I think they wanted me to either go into business or go to law school. So, so <laughs> Which to be fair, which to be fair may have taken me down the same path to run for office anyways, but um, but yeah, I, I was definitely raised with a sensitivity and an awareness um, of, of those issues. And, and in that regard, um, I, I do carry that with me. Now you are, you have announced that you are running for Ward 6. That's why you were on the show. Um, yes. You would not be a good candidate if you were not speaking to the voters. So uh -huh. I'm going to ask a double-edged question here. On your website, lanabentley.ca, which will be linked in the show notes, I would highly recommend anyone checking out for, for who lives in Board 6. You have seven priorities that you've listed that you want to advocate for. And I'm going to list them here and then I'm going to ask my question. Community member access to playgrounds and parks accessible recreation, snow removal, youth crime, property taxes, restoring trust in city hall. Before we dive into some of those key priorities, are these the priorities that you're hearing from residents of Ward 6? Yes, there, there are a few others that are not on the website and it's not because they're not important. It's just because the volunteer who manages the website has not been able to do an update. Uh, but there are some pretty, um, I don't want to overstate it because Ward 6 is comprised of a number of different communities, but certainly I think the issue of um, youth engagement and youth on youth safety issues, um, there, there are some fairly strong and pressing concerns in certain parts of the ward, for sure. So yes, that, that is what I've heard on the doors. Are you shocked about what you're hearing at the doors? Because usually when a candidate goes into an election like this, even if it being their first uh, campaign, they might have an assumption of what they're going to hear, whether it be property taxes, whether it be uh, safe uh, streets, whether it be this, that, or the other. Are there concerns that you're hearing that you're going, whoa, I didn't expect to hear this at the door? Property taxes and snow removal, I was not surprised <laughs> to hear those two. Um, and I'll be honest, I myself have, uh, I, I drive a very fuel efficient tiny car that has been stuck and thank you to my neighbors. Um, and I want to thank them in advance for helping me push my car out when it gets, <laughs> if it gets stuck this winter. Um, yeah, you, you know, I, I think the ones about safety, Chris, the, those ones were quite interesting to me. And they were quite interesting to me because they're actually coming from parts of the ward uh, where I think, um, and I hate to say it, but sometimes we have certain um, certain ideas about the challenges that folks in certain neighborhoods face. And I met with a parent, a parent advocacy group and um, you know, it's in a fairly well-resourced part of the ward and a well-resourced part of the city. And so to hear about um, young people getting physically assaulted in the middle of the day 
and people having to pull over their cars and, and intervene. Um, it, it, was, it was quite troubling. And I think that what was really interesting to me was um, at the end of the day, sadly, one of the few things that don't discriminate in our world are social problems. <laughs> they really could care less what your race is, where you live, what your postal code is. Uh, when people are feeling under pressure or isolated or misunderstood or excluded, or just generally unwell for whatever reason. Um, problematic behavior can express itself. So certainly the safety concerns, Chris, were um, surprising to me, as was um, the frustration in the community around who can help us. And so when I did my own um, work around what resources could we activate, um, I, I certainly learned a lot about how certain resources um, in the city are allocated. And, um, you know, I, I went back to that, that parent advocacy group and, and shared as much as I could and tried to link them with other community groups who had run uh, different community driven uh, safety uh, initiatives. But certainly that one, Chris, was, was the most uh, surprising. And, and I want to I, I want to punctuate it. I think that with some community development and a lot of stakeholder engagement, including hearing from young people <laughs> in the community, like, hey, guys, what's up? Uh, like, what does this mean? Um, I, I think these are these are challenges that we can flip um, to a more positive outcome. Uh, but I, I will say, Chris, uh, Ward 6 is very diverse in terms of, you know, you have Aspen, Springbank, and then you have older homes like the Tri Glen area, where um, some people assume I live in Ward 8. And I'm like, no, I live across the street. <laughs> I, live, I live in Ward 6. But you know, you, you have these uh, communities that have a really strong sense of uh, community regional identity. And they're very different from each other. And the fact that they're all um, populated together now um, creates for some interesting opportunities. Uh, for somebody who's representing all those needs. And, you know, issues like the arena deal, Chris, I hear a very distinct message uh, when I'm in one cul-de-sac uh, versus another. And then I've also heard some people say, you know, we're really blessed and privileged and we don't, we don't have a lot that we would want to see different versus other people in the ward who are fearful that they're going to lose um, their affordable housing. So um, I think Beyond specific issues, Chris, I think I've been very moved uh, just by how you can have people living in the same ward with such distinct experiences of, of our city and our community. One area, and I wasn't going to stay on this topic for long, but yeah. you, you seem to be passionate about it and it seems to be an issue. And it's not just an issue, I, I would say, in Ward 6, it's an issue across the city. Um, the, the issue around safety, around crime, mm. around youth crime. Uh, I'm up here in Ward 10. And before I moved here, the first thing I did was I researched the stats and I researched the area before buying a house because I wanted to know where I was moving. And I think more and more people are doing that. Um, there has been an increase in crime, I would say, and this is me, me stating what I've seen and not some stat I'm going to pull out of my butt here, but I'm just stating what I've seen. How do we combat a rise in crime mm. while trying to keep our budget intact? Because if you, if you raise the cost for policing, taxes right. are going to go up. That's right. People are, and if you raise taxes, you're going to hear another swat of people <laughs> saying something completely different to you. So how do you balance that with the safety aspect of keeping people safe in our communities, but also not increasing the bottom line? And, and this is a good question. And you're right, I am passionate about it. So I think that law enforcement plays a part in our collective sense of safety. I'll give you an example though, Chris. Um, the other day I'm working from home in my living room. I see a young man on a skateboard with this gorgeous dog zip by my house. A couple of weeks later, I'm in the dog park. I bump into him and I'm like, are you that kid <laughs> who was skateboarding with your dog? And he's like, that was me. And, and a couple of days ago, I was driving home uh, from Santerra and guess who I see out walking his dog. And I rolled down my window and said, hey, remember me? And he's like, yeah, how you been? You know, staying cool in the 
me. And, and the reason I share that, Chris, is because when we're actually looking at what makes people feel safe, quite often it doesn't have to do with the presence of a professional. It has to do with knowing your neighbors, feeling comfortable to move around your neighborhood. Um, I do. I've walked my dogs well after dark wearing an iPod. And now if my mom and dad hear this, they are going to freak out a little bit. But, but the point being, I, I know my neighbors, they know me and where I live in my immediate community. I've, I've never really had concerns about where I go and when. And the reason I want to share that is because um, I, I believe that, you know, there have been a few times I've seen the odd patrol car in my area, but not that often, and, and that's not a criticism. They don't need to be here um, because for the most part, everybody um, talks to each other. They know their neighbors. It's not unusual. Uh, one of my neighbors uh, had a, a teenager who turned, you know, they had their sweet 16 during the pandemic, invited the entire block to come watch a drag show in the middle of the street. So, you know, like, do you want to move to my neighborhood, Chris? It's really fun. <laughs> Convince my husband and I will be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> so Which just ended any chance of me ever being elected for Ward Ted right there. <laughs> I know, I know you shouldn't have said that. But, but the point being, when you actually look at those factors that serve as protective factors against problematic behavior and social disorder, law enforcement is one piece of a larger puzzle. Most often when it comes to creating safer communities, what we're talking about is social inclusion. It needs to be having safe, accessible public spaces and safe, accessible, inclusive ways to get there. And so if I notice that my neighbor's you know, sidewalk has not been shoveled, that would be a question mark for me because we tend to know each other's um, patterns of behavior. So how do we create that social inclusion? It more so has to do with good old fashioned community development, which relative to paying for emergency services is quite a bit cheaper because what we're talking about are activities that create a sense of belonging and communication and shared investment. And we all live here and we want it to look nice. I've never had one of my neighbors call the city on me and say, her grass is too long, she needs to mow it. I mow it because there's a sense of social peer pressure in that everybody on the block takes good care of their properties. Now that's an unspoken thing that shapes my behavior, Chris, but how does that happen? So I think that when it comes to creating a context and an environment that promotes neighborly behavior, um, I don't know what it's like where you live, but it's almost unspoken and intangible, but you know that it's there. And I think that we need to invest in early intervention, prevention, and neighborhood community development initiatives, which again, dirt cheap. That's somebody like me showing up with a clipboard. I'm not showing up with a cruiser and a lot of technology. That's something that we can have community development workers do. And the city does have a department of those folks available, but it is quite small, Chris. And those folks, those community neighborhood social workers, right now, those folks tend to be attached to neighborhoods that are perceived as having a higher level of need. Now, I think that makes perfect sense. But as I said earlier, certain social problems could care less about the income. So I'd like us to have a city where those community and neighborhood social workers are available to anybody whose community wants to access them. Because building that sense of social inclusion and community spirit, it's not just about safety um, outside of your house, but areas where, there's high, where there is higher social inclusion, that's preventative as it relates to mental health distress or family violence, et cetera. So I appreciate that in this election cycle, uh, money and economic recovery is huge, Chris. So I get that I am speaking from a slightly different lens. Um, however, I think if you want a thriving economy, you need thriving people to work in it. And so these are concepts that reinforce each other. I think a strong economy requires strong people and strong people live in strong communities, strong households, strong families. So I think rather than saying it's an either or, I think it's a both and. Um, and I, I totally appreciate I'm, I'm speaking a slightly different narrative. <laughs> Uh, than other candidates, but I'm okay with that because uh, I've seen firsthand the difference that it makes. And I would also highlight 
uh, there's an economic argument to be made for the approach that I'm taking as well. It's much cheaper than continuing to fund already uh, overburdened emergency services. So I hope that answers your question. In it, part. It, it does. It does. Uh, the next area I want to talk about is an area that I seem to have asked every single ward candidate because it seems to be their number one or number five or number six item on their list of on their website. And that is restoring trust at City Hall. There is a disconnect with what is happening at City Hall and the people that are of Calgary. I think that's easy to say there. In your opinion, what is broken at City Hall yeah. and how do we fix it? I think we do have a credibility issue. Let me tell you why, though. Um, first of all, uh, I think anybody who puts themselves out there to run for public office, we all have one thing in common. We all think we've got the best answer. <laughs> and we, you know, it's one thing to have confidence when you're interviewing for a job, but it's like, I really think everybody should vote for me. And so um, I, I think we all share that in common is we think we have the right answer. Now, the credibility issue that I'm talking about, and um, obviously you've, you've met with way more candidates than I have. I think, Chris, an effective city councillor is somebody who has the ability to take action at the local level while still thinking about the bigger picture. I think because in recent years we have seen really, really dramatic disruption at the bigger picture. I think the disconnect is we've now started to see folks who should, based on their mandate, be devoting a fair bit of their time to action for their constituents. You know, it, it's, I, I've been to a number of candidate forums and I hear people running at the ward level talking about job creation plans, um, talking about issues that are important, Chris, but let me let me offer this. Of all the people I've talked to since I announced my candidacy, not one person in Ward 6 has said, Lana, what are you going to do to create a job? What they have told me, though, is I need to be able to drive my children to school during the winter. I'm freaked out by the fact that there are homeless people in, in, a, in a city as wealthy as ours. <laughs> And, and I don't know what to tell my children about why we can't find homes for those folks when they see them out and about. So I think the credibility issue and I think the lack of confidence in City Hall, obviously we have very intelligent people in City Hall. Obviously we have people who are working hard. I think there's a misalignment though, Chris, between the priorities that they are pursuing versus the actual priorities of the folks in Ward 6. And so for example, we were out and about a few weeks ago and um, a lady came out and said, what do you think about the arena deal? And so I, I gave her my impression of it. And, and I'll be honest, Chris, I did say to her, uh, I think it's going to be awfully hard to get the toothpaste back in the tube on that one. <laughs> um, I, I think we're, we're, we're at a place now where, where it is what it is. And, and she was of much the same mindset, though she wished a different decision had been made. But when we actually dug into it, she said, Lana, I can't afford to go to a hockey game. Like I don't make that much money. So at the very least, like, can you make sure that the local hockey arena is clear for my grandkids? So at the very least, there's something that I can do that's meaningful to me. And so I think that that lack of trust in city hall isn't necessarily based just on personal attacks or, or thinking the worst of people, but I think there's a credibility issue in that I think some folks on our city council, um, they're focusing on, on things that are of provincial interest or citywide interest, and I think it would do a lot to restore faith um, with community members and trust if they were more visible in their wards. And I've, I've already uh, declared, you know, downtown Calgary and City Hall, that may be where I spend some of my time, but if I'm your Ward 6 City Councillor, this is where I do the work. And I think that that lack of visibility and at times decision making that seems more citywide focused versus locally focused, I believe that's my opinion, Chris, on why there's so much frustration. Because most people I've talked to are actually 
very understanding and reasonable of the decisions that get made. And even if they don't agree with them, they've said to me, hey, I get it, not going to agree with my representative all the time. But I really wish that person would be more responsive about bike path maintenance or about making sure the playground equipment near my home is up to snuff. So that's that's my take on it. Is that sort of what you're hearing from others or am I? Well, no, I, I do want to jump on that because you've opened up a question that I've asked all the other candidates as well. Sure. And um, it's while you were there to represent your ward, you also have to look at the bigger picture and represent yes. Calgary. And I think I think you've stated a little bit, but I want to piggyback on what you were just saying there. How do you envision yourself representing all of Calgary? Because sometimes your ward will have to go without for that playground because there is there is more there is a more pressing playground that needs to be addressed down in Ward 12 or in Ward 4. So how do you envision yourself working and being that transparent counselor yeah. when you're saying hey, you know what, I would love to have this uh, park in your this area fixed in Ward 6, but at this time, we can't do it, A, because of financial issues, but B, there's a more higher priority for this area of the city. Yeah, I, I think what you're speaking to is the ability to know when unwavering centeredness is required on an issue versus flexibility. Yes, I, I, I believe I possess that. And, you know, when I worked in healthcare, uh, my final role with Alberta Health Services was managing an inpatient psychiatric unit. I think we only had 14, 15 beds, Chris. Um, we would have weekly calls where we would try and find places for people to navigate the system. And there was a lot of uh, not negotiating, but there was a lot of collaborating around what can we do with what we have. The reality is, as a city councillor, if you want to get things done, you're going to have to work with other people and you're going to have to balance your needs versus their needs. And I think, you know, I've, I've been really clear. I do really value evidence. I think a good idea that is backed up by facts is worth more than rigidly adhering to a political ideology. I also think you need to know how to work well with others. And I think there is some humility and having the comfort to accept that not every moment is your moment. And if you're able to keep your eye on the bigger objective, I think if you're willing to work with others and they're willing to work with you, there is a sweet spot to be found in between. You know, Chris, um, where I work, we offer um, treatment groups for folks who've been mandated for domestic violence treatment. And we do a lot of work on relationship management and relationship skills. One of the concepts that we teach folks is in relationships, you have the right to get your way some of the time. Okay. Not, not all, not all. And, and I think that as an elected official, I'm, I'm going into it knowing, Chris, that there are some issues of citywide importance uh, that are not necessarily uh, perceived with the same level of urgency by folks in Ward 6. And uh, my decision making on that is going to have to rely on uh, evidence base, evidence based facts, consultation with the community, but also considering the broader good of Calgary, which hopefully um, benefits the folks of Ward 6. If something's good for the city, then it's good for Ward 6. But it may, it's that, it's that um, tension point between urgent versus important. So something of longer term importance may not be of immediate um, urgency to people in Ward 6, but if it's good for the city, we're working off the assumption that longer term, uh, there's a benefit um, to folks in this community as well. Now, looking at just your ward here for a second, um, the role of a counselor is to advocate for their residents, whether it be your, your ward, whether it be a certain community organization in your ward. Sometimes the alignment of the issues that people are bringing to you may not align with the issue, the belief system that you may have going into council, right. whether that be, hey, this park just got re, uh, revamped a year ago. They want to upgrade it more because more people have moved into the area. But because of the system, because of the uh, dynamics that are at City Hall, that isn't scheduled even to be looked at for the next like 20 years. Mm -hmm. Do you have the ability to say no? And how do you see yourself 
working with groups when you have to disagree with what they want in your ward? So are you asking, do I have the ability to say no to folks in Ward 6? Yes, because sometimes they might come to you with this high, sky in the blue. Hey, I want the max line to run down my street because I want a, uh, a bus stop right in front of my house. Is it feasible? Possibly. Is it financially responsible? Might not for one person to do this. Do I have the ability to say no or make difficult decisions? A hundred percent. Yes, and, and I've done it throughout my career. Um, I think, you know, I managed an inpatient unit. <laughs> um, I, I worked in eating disorders, an issue that has uh, one of the highest mortality rates in all of psychiatry. I've had to have very difficult conversations with people, Chris, where I've had to deliver bad news or tell them something that was very difficult for them to hear, but I've done it anyways. And I think that the key to being a successful leader is that you have to at times disagree, but you need to own that decision and you need to own it 110%. And I would also say that just because I'm not necessarily in alignment with one issue, that doesn't mean that that would be applicable to a different one down the road. And, um, you know, I, I think stepping into the spotlight of being um, an official with some sort of public profile means you have to be comfortable with that. And, and I certainly wouldn't be, I wouldn't be stepping into this adventure um, unless I knew that about myself. So, you know, with respect, I think um, there are others running um, for counselor positions who have worked in high stress positions. I've worked in what I would consider one of the highest stress contexts possible, where these were life or death decisions. And again, um, there were times when I had to say things that were difficult for folks to hear, but I did it anyways. Now, with that being said, um, I think that uh, there also needs to be a system of accountability for folks who are counselors. And I think sometimes though we may believe uh, that we've looked at an issue thoroughly and been as objective as we possibly can. Um, I think nobody is uh, perfect when it comes to having blind spots. And so I can acknowledge that I probably do have blind spots, but because they're blind spots, Chris, I don't know that I'm consciously aware of them right now. And so I think that to be fair, um, I would not wanna see a city council with 15 Lana Bentleys because that's called an echo chamber. And I think that the beauty of municipal politics is everybody gets one vote. And I think that although the process can sometimes be difficult, it can uh, require a lot of energy, um, I know that the way that I've grown in my career and as a person, as, an, as a professional, has been just as much from having to engage with folks I disagree with as those where we are 100% aligned on an issue. And I think, Chris, in recent years, just given the complexity of issues that we're facing, I really value the people who stand outside of my echo chamber. Speaking of the next few years, one of the big things that yeah. next, the next the council will have to deal with is let's call it what it is COVID-19 the global yes. pandemic has ravaged the city's financial system um, people are unable to pay their taxes because they have been laid off people are struggling mentally uh, people are becoming homeless houselessness is on the rise within Calgary um, the next city council will have to deal with these issues but also the recovery aspect of this pandemic, but also the economic downturn that was the oil and gas sector leaving the city. First off, mm -hmm. why why get involved knowing that this is on the this is on the plate because this is a big challenge for someone who wants to work to build a community. And I understand that would be doing that would be building a community with a recovery, but it's a large task. Are you up for it? Yes. Yeah. How do how do we ensure then that nobody gets left behind? Because that is the thing that I think a lot of people are struggling with their, when laying down at night is how do I ensure that I can make it to next week? How can I ensure to make it to next paycheck? How can I ensure not being homeless? How can I ensure my kids are safe in the next few years? How do you envision yourself working with all Calgarians to ensure that they are all recovered and not just a select few? 
I appreciate that question because I think that actually speaks to one of my strengths, Chris, in that there's a really dominant narrative of, I'm going to run it like a business. We need more people to run it like a business. Let's all run it like a business. Let's be open for business. And I say that not to belittle the perspective of those who are pushing that narrative, but I want to be really clear. The devastation that has impacted our city, our province, our country, it's certainly not because there was a lack of business acumen at the table. It's because there was an unprecedented health issue that pretty much brought the world to a standstill. And so having the background that I do, Chris, I already knew that within a prosperous city like Calgary, there were people who were not thriving. When I hear the rhetoric of we need to get back to normal, my response quite often is normal or what was comfortable for those who were comfortable. So the reality is, even if we take the pandemic out of it, we know that from research pretty much across the board, the jobs that are most at risk of automation, the jobs that were most likely to see removed from the paid economy are jobs that are occupied A, by women, and B, by racialized groups, by younger workers, indigenous folks, and newcomers. Our economy pre-pandemic was already really precarious and highly vulnerable to the fluctuations in the energy sector. So I, 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 I realize that there's going to be some lag time between us talking today and, and when this airs, but we're just coming off of a week where we saw environment, uh, environmental related issues, extreme weather events that have now resurfaced for us, the conversation about climate change. The ocean is currently on fire, I believe, because of a pipeline burst near Mexico. These are, these are issues that, that we cannot say, let's go back to normal, because normal just describes a different level of inequity and struggle. So I think to your question about, am I up for the challenge? Yes, I am, because that is where I have by and large uh, devoted most of my career was to issues of accessible housing, making sure that people had adequate health care, um, taking a firm stance on family violence, et cetera. And I think that we need that voice at the table to introduce different ways of looking at problems and looking at issues apart from we're going to run it like a business. And my issue with we're going to run it like a business is when you run a business, you get to say, here's the product and I sell it to who I sell it to. There's a really great vegan vegetarian restaurant in Ward 8. I love it. And if I don't want to have vegan vegetarian food, I can go down the street and I can have some cluck and cleaver. Now, that's the beauty of running a business is you get to serve your consumer base. That's not necessarily what a government does. You have to serve everybody. And I think that where, while some business minded, uh, while some business acumen is absolutely appropriate, we also need to have those who come from a different worldview who understand uh, that a dollar spent in permanent supportive housing saves the system overall countless dollars with regards to engaging emergency services, et cetera. So um, I think to your point, Chris, I've, I have not used the rhetoric of I want to get back to normal. Um, I'm also not using the rhetoric of we need to be future proof because that's impossible. We don't know what the future holds, but we can make our economy more future fit, which means from my mind, we need to be, we need to be exploring why half the population, women, were so much uh, more negatively impacted by the pandemic. We also need to make sure we know in the wake of a disaster or a pandemic, we know exactly what mental health problems, Chris, are likely to present themselves. Addictions, mood, and anxiety disorders. We need to have resources in place to offer support at the population community level to catch people before they end up in the throes of absolute despair and crisis. And so I, I think we all want the same thing. Like, like I want the exact same thing that my colleagues who are saying the answer is in the business. Yeah, okay, we all want the same outcome. But I believe there are different ways to get there. And I would also say what differentiates uh, me from the pack, Chris, is I'm not going in uh, with a mindset of we need to cut everything to the bone. Um, I'm not that candidate. Um, and I would also question when folks say I'm going to cut to the bone, what does that mean? When you actually do a breakdown of the city budget, um, where would we cut? Because the things that people tend to assume uh, we're overspending in, when you actually look at the dollar by dollar breakdown, 
it's pretty stinking small, Chris. So I, I hope that answers your question. But yes, I, I have thought about recovery. And because the question I, I got to follow up with is the the budget is going to be the first priority that the next council will have to deal with. It is going to be a four-year budget, a template for the next four years. The idea that we are going to know exactly what the next four years is going to look like with the Delta variant. And yet again, we, like you said, we are recording this in July and this is coming out in the last week of second, last week of August. So, so how do we ensure that this this year's budget that you as the next councillor for Ward 6 will have to vote on helps people and doesn't, as you say, cut to the bone. Because the services that people rely on, the low income, the people who are the hardest hit because of this pandemic, who rely on the services that the city provides, would have to be cut. Are you saying right here, right now, that you would stand up and say, no, we cannot cut these because people rely on them. Data proves that these some of these services, like free use of the pool for low-income earners, the seniors uh, riding on the TTC, or TTC, wow, the Toronto brain. <laughs> Toronto brain is getting out here right now. This tells Can you, you how edit that out, Chris? I will certainly <laughs> edit that out. But people who ride on the Calgary, the the red line, the blue line, and potentially, hopefully soon when they break ground, the green line. How do you envision yourself standing up and saying, you know what, we need to help everyone and we can't cut everything to the bare bone as some people are, like you said, and I've interviewed a few, are suggesting that we do. You know, well... Excellent question. In, in so far as I think you know how I'm going to answer, um, I, I am that person who's going to stand up in council, Chris. And here's the thing, not just because I think or feel that it's the right thing to do, but there is an economic argument to be made for the perspective I have. Anytime we have slashed and burned things in the short term, that helps to make good on a campaign promise but we sure as heck pay for it later. And I think when folks actually, if you unpack the budget and those, those things that we're spending money on big ticket items, and, and look, I, I know how much it costs to have somebody uh, go through EMS, have their temperature taken in the ER, see a doctor and get admitted for one day. That's really, really expensive. And granted, that's a provincial issue. If we're thinking about this holistically, I promise you, and for those who are on the call saying, gee, I don't know, don't we need to be cutting things? We could, but we're going to pay for it later. And we're not just going to pay for it later by having to spend money and lots of money. <laughs> These are big ticket items when people have to engage with emergency services. But I think that the cost to quality of life and the negative impact on overall wellness that it has uh, we're going to pay that way as well. So here's the thing, Chris, I've been very open about who I am as a candidate. Um, I've been very clear um, that I will work hard for the people of Ward 6. And a vote for me is a vote for somebody who has dedicated their career to equity and inclusion and making sure that nobody gets left behind. So um, you know, I, I think that the reason I'm being so bold in how I market myself is because at a certain point, Chris, the math doesn't work for anybody who's saying we're going to cut things and maintain our level of service. How is that possible? I'm being really open and honest that, of course, Chris, like, like, you know, I'm a homeowner. And when I went to buy my house, I didn't say to the realtor, could you get me to pay more? Of course, I like a good deal too. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm a human being. I, I shop around. I want a good deal. I want to make sure that my dollar goes as far as it possibly can. But I will say that the people of Ward 6 that I've engaged with, there's an acceptance of taxes. There's an acceptance that things cost money. What people want to be assured of is value. And I'm a person who can speak to that. Um, and, and I know what, I know what value is. I know that it's cheaper to run things in the community that are prevention and early intervention focused versus paying for crisis services. So I, I hope that answers, but yes, I, I would be that voice. I would it be does. that voice. It does. Uh, let's go into the next set of yeah, questions here is sure. October 19th, 2021. Yes. You are a counselor elect for ward six. 
what is your first priority? Yeah, I've, I've had that question before. What's, what's the first thing you're going to do? Um, I believe that things finish how they start. And so I want to start in a really balanced and grounded way, Chris. It's about building relationships. It's about learning the role and, and not just learning the role, but learning the role at a very unique point in time. We will have just had a more than likely, I'm going to guess, a federal election. <laughs> we will be just, yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, to, to be fair, this will be the fall after, you know, like, like, will kids be back in school? What will the state of our economy be? This will be learning the job during an extraordinary uh, point in time. So as a counselor, I, well, I just think how I govern my life. I believe things finish how they start. So start out well. Um, and I also think that, um, uh, you know, I, I think everybody has knowledge and perspective. So I would certainly want to learn uh, from my predecessor who formally held the role. And I think there's something to be said for continuity and for those initiatives that he was midway through. Um, I think I owe it to the people of Ward 6 uh, to make sure that I'm fully uh, up to date on those files uh, so that nobody's issues um, go missing in that transition period. Now, what would be a and I use this word uh, uh, lightly, a win for you for your first term. Looking back, if you get back, if you win, you, you have four years to accomplish what you can accomplish in four years. What would be a win for you? I think a win for me, Chris, is those issues on my website, the Ward 6 issues. I want to be able to go back to folks and and make good on our conversations. So I, I understand that some of those issues are enduring. I would also say with property tax, the vast majority of Calgarians are not having a, an increase to their property tax, residential that is, this time around. So um, I, I do think there's that conversation is taking up less space. Uh, but certainly there are some parts uh, of the ward where families have said, we really do want our kids to have a safe accessible playground. Uh, I spoke with a gentleman over the weekend who said, could you do something about bike path maintenance so that me and my grandkids uh, can be together outdoors? So I, I think I think following through on that list, but, but I would also say, um, and you surfaced it earlier, there are some big city as the whole issues that we need to take action on. And one way or another, Chris, we need resolution. And so I, I'd like to be a part of the council that was able to say it either is or it isn't, but here's the decision. And now there's action that's observable and measurable. And I would also say, um, I was encouraged by students uh, at, uh, at Mount Royal University to run. I don't know if that's because they think I'd be good in public office or if this is their sneaky way of getting rid of me for next semester. But um, issues of, of racial unrest, Chris, have, have touched a generation of young folks. And I think the city has started some conversations about what does that look like. Um, I very much want to be a part of a council that demonstrates they were listening and a council that implements meaningful change to all Calgarians. Um, so there are some city as a whole issues uh, that I'm very much um, looking forward to being a part of, of, of measurable and observable action. I think at a certain point, we have to move from awareness of an issue to action. Um, and so there's a few big ticket issues that I would want to be a part of that conversation. If elected, you would be yes. one, one of a few, if not one of two, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong here. I don't know the full history. Uh, woman, person of color, elected into that position. What would that mm -hmm. mean to you as a Calgarian? And what would you hope that would mean to the city? Whoa. Um. Going deep <laughs> for the last few minutes here, Lana. <laughs> You know what it would mean to me? Um, that anything is possible in our city and that we value talent 
and that we value people for what they can bring and what they can do versus what they look like. And, and I know that that seems almost trite. However, you wouldn't have had to ask me that question unless there was a real lack of representation um, for women and people of color on council. And as I said earlier, when, when I chose to run, it wasn't for sympathy. Um, it wasn't to have people uh, feel better about themselves so that they could say they voted for somebody like me. It was because I truly believed that in 2021, Lana Bentley had something to offer the city of Calgary. So I think that progress is happening, Chris, and I wouldn't be here with you today unless it was. And I'm very confident uh, that the young men and young women and young non-binary folks in Calgary, uh, there will come a time when the question that you just asked will seem so out <laughs> and, and I hope so I, I hope you didn't take it as a as an insult when I asked the question. Not it was just at a, all. It was an honest question because I think that is a uh, in 2021 that we ha still are having this conversation that we need more women in politics is ridiculous to my uh, in my opinion. But that's just here nor there. <laughs> Oh, I, 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 I didn't take offense to it. And if anything, Chris, I think what you just named is when I tell people that I'm running for office, half the time I get, that's amazing, congratulations. And then the other time, the other 50%, what I hear is, you're so brave. I think it is so sad that people think you have to be brave to want to put your hat in the ring for this. This is your city council. I mean, yes, it's it's kind of a it's a different experience to run for political office. It is by far the most unique job interview I've ever gone through. However, I think that we need to create an environment where when you say I'm running for office, people say, congratulations. I, I can't agree. wait to hear more about your platform. Uh, last set of questions here. Yes. Why, why should Lana Bentley be the next city councillor for Ward 6? On my website, we have the expression, the difference that makes the difference. I think we have just come through an exceptional year. And I think that in order for us to move forward in a way that is future fit and more resilient, we need to think differently, we need to behave differently, and we need to treat each other differently. What I represent, Chris, is a vision for Calgary and a perspective on how we can treat each other differently, think differently, um, and do better. I represent a perspective that we haven't quite had the opportunity to see very much of on council. And I'm not talking about being a black woman. I'm talking about being a former family therapist who works at a large women serving agency. I think that our city council is better for the richness of diversity of thought, experience, and background. And I think that what I offer is something different. I have nothing but respect for people who engage in public service. And I also think two things can be true at once. I can value what's come before and still appreciate the need for us to mix things up and have new voices at the table. So with humility, um, I would ask people to consider Lana Bentley on October 18th, because I have a really strong track record of improving the lives of Calgarians. And I think that that perspective is exactly what we need more of as we head into some pretty tough times. Um, for those who are listening, for those across the city and particularly in Ward 6, yeah. um, Lana, I have the question to ask, how can people learn more? How can people learn more about yourself? How can people get involved in your campaign? You have a month and a half left until the election day. Uh, like I said, this is coming yeah. out last week of August, but how can people get involved in your campaign? I think the first step is to visit the website. Uh, but for those who have watched this and said, I'm already in, you can email hello at lanabentley.ca, L-A-N-A, uh, B-E-N-T-L-E-Y dot C-A, hello at Lana Bentley dot C-A. And we would be more than happy to talk about how we can put your passion and your energy to good, uh, to good use. 
you don't need any political experience. All you need is an appetite uh, to help build a strong, uh, inclusive Ward 6. And I'm happy to accept support from across the city. So if you're, if you're coming all the way from Ward 1, 2, doesn't matter. Um, if you're connecting with my message, please uh, please consider uh, joining our team, our movement, hello at lanabentley.ca, or just come to the website, lanabentley.ca. For those listening and for my uh, for the watchers, uh, the link to Lana Lana's uh, website, Facebook page, Twitter, and also email will be in the show notes. Yes, she pointed right to it in the show notes. <laughs> Connect. Uh, this is an important election across the city. This is an important election for the future of Calgary. I highly recommend anyone who is still sitting on the fence at this point in time to do their research. And hopefully you, if you live in Ward 6, you do your research with Lana. Uh, Lana, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a, such a pleasure and a great hour of my time that I was didn't know where it was going to go because I've only done a bit of research on you, but I, I feel like we're best friends now. <laughs> And Chris, the next time we're having an epic block party in the streets, I'm going to email you if you can make the drive down from your ward, you won't be disappointed. And we have the Glamorgan Bakery, so cheese buns and chocolate chip buns. Yes, I will be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> Lana, <laughs> thank, thank you so much.